Thanks for tuning in today. If you're new here, I'm Jay Baker, Head of Industry at Link Group. And in this podcast series, we talk to industry experts about subjects affecting listed companies, boards, shareholders, and everyone in between. Topics like ever-changing regulation, governance, shareholder engagement, and much more, of course. So if you're interested in issues touching our world, you might want to consider subscribing on whatever platform you get your podcasts. That way you won't miss an upload. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's get on with today's episode. Welcome to today's podcast in which we'll be discussing the restoring of trust in audit and corporate governance generally uh, and the outcomes of the Kingman Review, Brian Review and the CMA consultation that was uh, that was released earlier this year. Uh, I'm joined today by Caroline Emmett. Now Caroline is the Senior Manager of our company secretarial division here at Link, a group called Company Matters. And Caroline will be able to give us some real good insight into uh, what the proposals mean and what that may have bring to to, to uh, issuers generally. So Caroline, can I ask you to say hello and to give a little bit of a background uh, of, your, of your career thus far? Hi Jay, thanks very much and, and hello to everyone. So um, I'm a senior manager within Company Matters. Uh, We provide company secretarial services to um, a range of listed companies um, from uh, investment trusts to AIM companies to FTSE 250 and 350 companies. Um, Within that, I'm, I'm a bit of an odd animal in that I only started my career as a company secretary seven years ago. Uh-uh. Before that, I worked in investment banking in mergers and acquisitions primarily, uh, but also a, a range of other areas. So, um, yeah, a, a bit of an odd animal, um, but very much enjoying the change and looking at things from the inside of the boardroom as opposed from the outside. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you, Caroline. Well, we're here to talk about the audit and corporate governance restoration of trust or restoring trust in audit and corporate governance as it's otherwise known. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the consultation has been wide ranging. We're expecting quite a bit of output from the consultation uh, and what that will mean for issues in the future are some complicated new scenarios. Of course, the consultation discusses things like increasing directors' accountability, um, changing companies' approach to their financial statements and reporting, automatic clawback of bonuses and the rest of it, and with far-reaching powers for the FRC, or, or soon to be to be known as ARGA, the Audit Reporting and Governance Authority. And I just wondered, Caroline, if you could give us a, a, a quick appraisal, if you like, of the main impacts of the new proposals or the proposals that companies should be aware of? Sure. Well, there's, um, I think it's something like 150 recommendations in the consultation. Yeah. Um, And people by now will be well aware that it's over 230 pages long or so. Mm. Um, 600 responses have been received, uh, which is why it's um, going to take a bit of time, I think, for mm. some clarity to evolve. Mm. But um, there are there there were three, sorry, six probably main areas that you could group the um, the proposals into: directors of accountability, audit process, um, annual accounts, executive pay, dividends, and changes to the audit market. Now. Um, I, I think one of the um, interesting places to start, um, because it, it covers a, a whole range of aspects of the consultation, is um, the increased accountability for directors. The the new regulator, Arga, as you say, is going to have the power to sanction directors of all large companies for breaches in their duties uh, under the Companies Act 2006 that relate to uh, report and accounts. Mm. But also it's proposed that they will cover the new responsibilities and obligations acquired under the consultation or the outcomes of the consultation. And this is different to what we had in the past, whereby the FRC could only sanction directors if they were members of one of the um, accounting bodies. Mm. So a larger scope of directors being brought into account. And it'll be interesting to see how that pans out in practice. 
when you take into consideration that a lot of the director population are actually overseas directors, not necessarily based in the UK. That's an interesting point, actually, Caroline. Do you you see that as a barrier for the potential barrier, for example, of new directors coming to the UK to represent UK companies in either executive or NED positions? It's, you know, there's there's all sorts of um, things that have been discussed in terms of what the impact of this could be. And, and that certainly could be one of them. I, I think, you know, we have to remember that it, it would be prosecution or, or enforcement of uh, sanctions for a, a breach of director's duties. And no director um, starts off their career thinking that they're going to be in breach of their duties. And, and generally, directors sure. do take those duties um, very seriously and make sure they they do discharge them properly. But yeah, I, I think, you know, some of these arrangements are are going to make directors perhaps think twice. Uh, and, and maybe that's not a bad thing. No, <laughs> absolutely. I, the reason I asked that question, I think, is because with, with regulation as it is, um, and you know we've we've come off the back of Brexit, and and there's been other recent changes. Um, do we feel that the UK is becoming overregulated in a way where we have such good practices already in place, like comply and explain, uh, and we have a very good structured corporate governance regime? Um, is there a fear that that additional regulation is harmful? Or is the feeling as a result of the the, the responses um, quite positive to, to the increased regulation? So there, there are always voices that have um, said, and, and this goes back to, you know, when I first started working and we start uh, as a company secretary and we started seeing mm. more and more corporate governance reforms being introduced, that it was a break on companies wanting to list in the UK, um, that it was a, a, a break on directors wanting to be directors of um, listed companies. I, I don't have... Um, the statistics to hand um, to to argue for and against that point. I I think the the government has tried to be proportionate uh, in the suggestions it's made. Um, from some of the feedback we've been hearing, in some instances, it's felt like not proportionate enough. Mm. And uh, and I think, you know, it, it will come down to the details uh, of, of the final proposals, because there's there's a lot that still needs to be thought through. Yeah. Overall, um, some of the meteor proposals um, like the the increased accountability of directors, the um, audit and assurance policy that's been proposed um, and um, the the strengthening of internal controls broadly speaking i think there's seems to be sort of a general acceptance that some tightening in those areas is is sensible or at least not unwelcome but there are some areas where i think bays is having to give a bit more consideration to the feedback received for example in respect of the the managed share audits where perhaps it the proposals it it feels like they're unduly onerous for some companies yeah. um, and for very little benefit. So I think it's yeah. very much a case of, you know, horses for courses in, 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 this, in this area. We'll just have to wait and see how much of the feedback is taken on board in that respect. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more with you. Uh, it, it's interesting. I think that uh, most investors will be fully supportive of of all of the uh, proposals um, because it, it 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 provides that level of comfort mm. in the issue of company uh, the, the, the performing and, and acting as it as it should as good corporate citizens. That that's an interesting point, Jay, because a couple of the proposals are about actually getting investor input into audit related areas. Mm. Um, so the the audit and assurance policy um, that's been proposed. There's discussion about uh, putting that to a non-binding vote by shareholders at the AGM uh, and also the audit committee being encouraged to seek shareholder views on the audit plan of companies, uh, which would mean that companies would have to share their audit plan with investors so that they can provide input. 
Now, one of the pieces of feedback that you hear time and time and again, particularly from some of the smaller companies, is the level of engagement that they get from investors mm. um, is very low as it is. And a lot of audit and uh, audit committee chairs or audit and risk committee chairs say that they never hear from their investors in terms of audit related matters. So, um, you know, it, it, investors really, if this is going to go ahead, um, are going to have to play a part for it to actually be meaningful and not just another box ticking exercise on both sides. We, absolutely, Caroline, I, I, I couldn't agree more. There's so much um, that we need to think about uh, for the future. I mean, one in particular, I think is quite important and one that investors will specifically be interested in, and that's the dividends and the more trans, the, the additional transparency, if you like, uh, uh, around dividends and what directors' responsibilities are. What's your thoughts on, on uh, the proposals regarding dividends, Caroline? Well, um, I, again, I think this is one area where people um, who've been providing feedback and, and are far better informed than I uh, in terms of the technical elements, uh, understand where Bayes is coming from and what the intent is, uh, and generally agree with it. Um, so in terms of uh, actually making sure that the company has sufficient distributable reserves, that dividends are being paid out of realized reserves, um, you know, it's important. We've seen companies uh, and very large companies pay illegal dividends in the past and then having to go through a very public and somewhat embarrassing rectifying exercise afterwards. So, um, you know, it's, 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 the intent is good uh, and, and it is important to, you know, to, to, to support that. But there are some real practical issues um, in terms of actually determining what the um, realized profits are, particularly for companies with a long profit history or for uh, and for groups. Um, so this is an area where um, audit committees and boards as a whole need to start thinking about, uh, you know, how, how they're actually going to address this proposal if it comes uh, to play. And, and also, obviously, the, the second part of those dividend proposals, which are a confirmation that the company is, is going to uh, remain solvent, you know, re as far as the directors can reasonably determine, um, for two years after having paid that dividend. So I, I think it's going to give companies pause for thought. Um, some commentators have talked about it maybe creating an element of restraint uh, in dividends whilst profits build up uh, to a point where they feel comfortable about giving those assertions. So, yes, I think that's going to be it, it's, it's one of the less talked about, perhaps, um, aspects of the consultation, but a very important one. Yeah, I, uh, I, I very real it, consequences. Absolutely. I agree. And of course, the, the directors are, are are on the hook, if you like, under Section 172 duties. They 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 will need to be able to uh, to to state within uh, some degree of confidence that the solvency uh, is there for the next two years. So yeah, I th I feel that that's a, that's going to be a big question. It's one that's going to occupy the mind of directors uh, when declaring dividends. Indeed. But but let's let's you know focusing again on on directors generally, there will be some additional powers to claw back uh, on on executive pay, bonuses in particular, and, and share awards. Now, this, of course, won't be in place uh, until Argo is fully established, and the clawback conditions have a minimum application period, I believe, of about two years. Is there anything there, uh, Caroline, that, that raises some red flags for you or for, for any of our clients? Do you know? I don't think so. I think, um, again, th there hasn't been an awful lot of um, focus on this, I, and partly because it's already in line um, with what we already have in place under the UK Corporate Governance Code, yeah. uh, and also um, under the, the or, or more uh, in more detail under the guidance for board effectiveness that accompanies it. But... Um, uh, you know the 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 idea is there will be more specific um, clawback provisions, uh, and uh, there's a minimum list that Argo is proposing. 
Uh, and as you say, the, the, the clawback would apply for a period of two years, which at the moment we don't have uh, a specific period. Mm. Um, so, so those are the two key differences. Yeah, sure. And, and moving to Director Steele, but now with auditors as well, um, there will be new reporting obligations on both auditors and directors around internal controls and detecting and preventing fraud. Um, the, the government is consulting on different options, including a regime similar in scope to, to the US's Sarbanes-Oxley Act on Director Attestation and Auditor Assurance on Internal, internal Controls. So I think this, if I'm right, uh, I think it only affects premium listed companies, but do tell me if I'm wrong. What are your views there regarding Director and Internal Controls and the proposed uh, options that are going to be available? So the, the government uh, is consulting on different options in that respect. Um, and the, there, are some, uh, there are a number of questions under each of the options and, and they're not mutually exclusive. And I think this is an area where we, we wait with a lot of um, interest to see what's going to happen. Yeah. The government's preferred option is not to go down the full US Sarbanes-Oxley route. Um, I think that's been pretty well trailed and discussed. It's, it's a more nuanced approach that they're looking to adopt. Um, and um, there's still questions as, as to the level of auditor assurance that uh, will be required or that perhaps companies might adopt on a voluntary basis, even if it's not mandatory. Um, I think we, we'll see more of that coming along. And it's one of those proposals where I think, again, it, it's it's really important to for companies to start thinking about now yeah. what preparations they should be making uh, on a uh, what a lot of people are calling a no regrets basis. So even if the proposals don't come out in um, any of the forms currently discussed, uh, which would be surprising, but there will be elements of that. What should they be doing now to prepare, to make sure that they're in a good place to to take on these new responsibilities and reporting? Because although it, it, it will initially only apply to premium listed companies, um, it will then extend to all public interest entities. Right. And let's remember that the definition of a public interest entity or PI is being expanded right. uh, under the consultations, potentially to include aim listed companies above certain threshold yeah. uh, and also large private companies. So, um, yeah, really important to get the right advice uh, on this. And I think in respect of that, there's there's two points to remember. First of all, um, your external auditor won't be able to advise you on how to strengthen your own internal controls because that's akin to them setting their own exam. So it will have to be somebody else that uh, you'll need to look for. And in that instance, if you're looking for, uh, if you're looking to appoint new auditors in the near to medium term, um, you might find that whoever's advising you on your internal controls, they won't, if, if it's another audit firm, they won't be able to participate in your audit tender mm. because it's this is one of the services that's subject to a one-year cooling period between finishing yeah. providing the service and starting to act as auditor. So um, you need to think, companies need to think very carefully about how to go ahead um, in, mm. in on this uh, and and just have very much the wider picture in mind if yeah. they're appointing an advisor. Yeah, I think there's a wider question on that generally as well. In, in that, you know, it, it, an annual review of the effectiveness of, of internal controls, you know, is there is there uh, sufficient time um, to to assess the, the controls that are already in operation. Um, so that, that's going to be something I think that uh, um, issuers and, and, and advisors are going are gonna to wrestle with. Yeah, definitely a, a lot of thought to go on that. And, and you know, it's important to remember uh, that every company, the journey will be different for, for, for different companies. So some will be much further down the road of maturity um, premium listed companies have been um, confirming the effectiveness of their internal controls under the UK Corporate Governance Code requirements 
um, and and so they will be in a different place perhaps to um, to to aim listed companies which have not had to go through that onerous process in the past. Um, but the level of rigor is going to be greater. Um, I think uh, is is likely to be greater. Definitely something that. I know a lot of clients are thinking about. Uh, others are being more complacent and, and they may find themselves pushing and, and, and competing with others for resources as the deadline for implementing whatever the outcome actually is looms. Interesting, interesting. So, so there's going to be a lot to think about for all types of companies uh, across the spectrum. Um, we are still awaiting uh, in bated breath uh, the outcome of the the consultation, um, and I think during during the next year uh, to to eighteen months, we're going to see uh, an awful lot of development, an awful lot of change, uh, and and no doubt some more debate on on the best way forward. Yeah, on on that point, um, one of one of the ways that you can start companies can start mapping out the way forward is by um, looking at the audit and assurance policy that um, is, is, is one of the aspects that's being consulted on. Um, this is a, a, a statement in your annual report to give investors um, a view on how you're obtaining assurance on not just the uh, financial side of the annual report, but on the non-financial aspects, which, as we know, is one of the areas where reporting requirements are growing. Mm. Um, and starting to look at that will help provide a roadmap for some of the other work that companies will need to prepare uh, in, for in respect of the, the outcome of this consultation. Absolutely. Uh, and that's an, the, the, um, that's an interesting point as well uh, on that the, the new policy will be required to explain on a three year rolling forward looking basis. So something to think about now uh, into the next couple of years. But always to keep it in mind, um, because that advisory uh, vote will need to be reviewed every three years, if I'm right. That's one of the proposals that's being considered. Yeah, 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 indeed. And and further wide reaching as well, in that there could be further thoughts around uh, what what's to be included, i.e., the, the the company's KPIs, for example, on on uh, director remuneration, and even. Uh, issues like climate uh, and the company's impact. So a lot for investors to think about as well as the companies and uh, and what that advisory vote may bring in terms of how how well the company is is considered to be doing in terms of its good corporate governance and uh, and and stewardship or rather the the investor stewardship of that company. And and Jay yeah this this very much ties into um, the new reporting requirements uh, for um, climate financial related disclosures uh, under TCFD. So um, think companies need to think about that as well in that context. And cut. Caroline and I went off on a bit of a tangent at this point, so I think it's a perfect point to wrap up. A huge thank you to Caroline for sharing some very useful insights on audit reform. And if you liked what you heard in today's episode, don't forget you can subscribe to our channel and stay up to date with future episodes. We've also got a range of previous episodes on our channel you can listen back to covering everything you need to know across a range of topics. And finally, if you'd like to suggest anything you'd like to hear us talk about in a future episode, we'd love to hear from you. I'll leave some details in the description about how you can get in touch. Thanks again for tuning in. Until next time.